I want to talk about Bram Stoker's Dracula that you worked on with Francis Ford Coppola. And what's interesting is this is another case where film to film and script to script, your genre and tone changed almost completely. <laughs> I mean, there's obviously some similarities in the fantasy of both stories, but also very, you know, very different tones. What was it like working on those? I mean, you, you were working on them seemingly at the same time. Well, it is interesting because it is, a, it is a, they're both about um, eternal life. They're both about wanting to live forever. And you'll see that in a lot of my stuff is that thematically that, that is, is what is eternal life all is cracked up to be, you know? Um, um, I still, and when I watch Dracula, which I do, we do use it in, in my workshops. Uh, I often say to myself, how, would, how did I get into that zone and how can I get back there? Cause it was a great zone to be in. When you had that great novel, you had Stoker's novel that, that nobody had ever done. Mm -hmm. They they just cast the novel aside. So, with um, and Hook had some darker moments in it that were smoothed out. Um, Dracula came out of the blue, and it turns out that Dracula was something that uh, I was more ready to write as a writer, and it more challenged by it. And I needed a darker. I needed as as Kathy Kennedy said. Oh, oh, now we know the dark side of you. You know, uh, Dracula was a much darker, but also a great love story. And um, I think not having that hook is about loving your family, you know, and about capturing your, your childhood, recapturing your childhood and being the, finding that kid inside you and that the child inside you. Dracula is about loss and redemption and um, uh, fall is falling from grace and being uh, resurrected. Um, and it's also about the power of love. Just saying that, the tones are completely different. So you can't inject the kind of humor into Dracula that you would rely on in Hook. So I couldn't write a funny scene between Dracula and, and Harker, between Keanu and, and, and Gary. I couldn't write a funny scene between Gary and Winona. There is no comic relief except for maybe Sir Anthony in that in that film. Uh, and also, uh, Francis said a wonderful, because I wrote both those scripts without those directors involved. Francis read Dracula, Stephen read Hook. They didn't they didn't exist in their in their playing field or in their radar. And they kind of blindsided both of them. Um, and I think because they were so different worlds, I had to. When I was down the rabbit hole on Dracula, I didn't want to be pulled out to go deal with Hook. And fortunately, Hook went forward while I was still working on Dracula, and it was in production, uh, and I didn't have to worry about it. I mean, I, I would see dailies, but it let me compartmentalize and ship, put, you know, put that Dracula helmet on and stuff there, that Dracula helmet on and go down, the, and go down into, into that world and stay there. And you were nominated for a Hugo Award for the screenplay of that film. Where does that script stack up for you in your CV? I mean, what was your what was your favorite part about writing that story? Well, the favorite part was working with Francis because Francis is a writer first. Uh, and he knows how hard it is to get those words on the page. And he, he knew how hard it was to find a way to adapt that book because he that would have been one of his favorite books as a camp counselor. Um, so it was being able to have conversations with Francis, knowing I'm talking to a writer and a writer is talking back to me. And he would, he would say, he, I think he said, you can, you can be a good director without being a writer, but you'll never be a great director unless you're first a good writer. Um, so you understand, you understand the, the, the mechanics of storytelling and you understand the mechanics of, 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 um, of character. You understand that the importance of character, the character drives the story. Uh, and also getting to see the cast bring that film to life, getting to watch uh, Gary and, and Francis butt heads and getting to watch Winona and, and, and Sadie Frost, who was incredible getting to watch Sir Anthony. They all loved the script. They actually defended the script. When Francis would want to make cuts or something or, take a scene out, they'd go, no, 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 uh, please don't cut that out. Um, uh, 
and and I think that to me was the was the joy of it is that they really really appreciated the writing. Whereas on Hook, you're changing and you're changing lines every day, and you're changing your the your stuff being changed on the set and what have you, which is fine. I don't mind that. But what I loved about Francis is that he said, this is the script we're shooting. He storyboarded it where on the, he called it the score on one side of the page was the actual shot storyboards that Peter Ramsey did. The other side was, was my screenplay, my shooting script, not just there's a whole wall of storyboards. It was right there. So you could open it up and look at it. If you didn't matter what department you were in, you could see what you were shooting that day, what the requirements were. Uh, and it was fascinating because he, he, I learned so much about prep and prep preparing and how the value of preparation. And that's what I do on my scripts now. I took all, everything I learned from Francis. Writing a script has pre-production that goes into writing the script. And that's sort of my method now. It's called a heart chart. And uh, it all came from my, my work with him. It was a joy to watch this man defy the studio be fearless in his in his courage about defending the the artistic integrity of the piece n never never wanting to give up or, or toss in the towel even when he didn't like the movie you know uh, uh that was uh, i don't i don't know if I, I haven't had that experience since and i'm not sure i ever will well he's but the was, guy who fought uh, had to fight his whole way through with the godfather so exactly there he were told tons me those of stories there tons he of told me those stories yeah yeah he would. He said, "I had to fire somebody at the end of every week so they wouldn't fire me." <laughs> you know, uh, and that whole thing about the chaos that he creates on set, like in in Apocalypse Now, that's his method. That's how he gets back in control. We had a, we had an instance like that on Dracula when we were in three days from shooting, we're in rehearsal at that famous church there on Highland and Franklin. Uh, uh, so it's got a big gymnasium. A lot of people go there to rehearse and. My ball house has got a high eight camera. He's filming the rehearsals and we're working and you get, you're using doll furniture and stuff, you know, and, um, and Gary is doing the scene where he brings Winona to his chest and she drinks the blood and they all rush in with their stuff. And he stands up and, and he's there giving the lines as they come in and he's standing up in the bed and, and he finally just stops and says, Francis, I can't do this scene. I can't do it. And Francis is going, what do you mean you can't do it? This is every line that you asked to be in here, all of you, that you, the scene is exactly what you wanted to do. What do you mean you can't do it? And he said, well, they're coming in here with all their, their potions and their crucifixes and their guns and silver bullets and acid. I'm standing here in my underwear delivering these lines, you know, because they've been in bed. Uh, and you, and, and he said, I can't do it. Uh, I, I, I feel stupid. You know, I'm naked. And, Francis said, okay, um, here's what we're going to do. Jim, you take everybody around the little petition to lunch. You guys reread this scene, and you get the scene right, and then I'll decide whether or not we're going to shoot this movie. And everybody goes, whoa. And, and me, I'm going, uh, uh, they're all looking at me, you know. Uh, okay, let's all go do what Francis he just goes, said. He just goes all in. And... and I got everybody around the corner. We sat down to eat, and all of a sudden we hear all this noise, crashes, and chairs and tables being and turning on. You know, and I go running out around the corner, and, and I see Francis disappearing out the back door with his little beret. He's turned over the tables. He's turned over the chairs. He's thrown coffee everywhere. I mean, he's totally trashed the set. And I got Anthony Hopkins, I got Richard Grant, I got uh, Gary Oldman, I got my other writer, I got y'all you know, standing there looking at me going, what the Oh, heck? no. <laughs> you know? And Anahid Nazarian is sitting there. His, she, his, she's been with Francis, for, she's now his producer forever. She was had a PhD in library science. So she had typed, I never typed the script after we, she would type everything. And then I would look over her shoulder and we'd edit. And she was standing there very demure with a notebook in her hand. And she said, Francis would like all of you to go home or to your, to your hotel or wherever you stay and wait. And he'll let you know if we're going to make this movie starting Monday or Tuesday. Now, this is before cell phones. You know, we're so we got to sit by the phone. And so, but in a matter of minutes, the word was all over town that Francis had lost it and was pulling the plug on the movie. And 
their people are calling their agents from what the hell we do, you know. And on he says, everybody but you, Jim, you stay. And to make a really interesting story this long, I'll make it shorter. Uh, Francis wanted me, she said, you're going to have a plane ticket tonight and you're going to go to Reno in the morning and you're going to spend the weekend with Francis. He likes to go there when he did it with the Godfather and for the last weekend before he starts shooting to work on the script. So at midnight, uh, I get a knock on the, our hotel door and my wife's asleep and uh, there's the airline ticket from uh, one of the assistants um, and uh, also a brown envelope with a VHS cassette in it. And it's the rough cut of Ellie Coppola's documentary on the making of Apocalypse Now. Still has a time code on it. With a note that says, watch this before you meet Francis. So I put I put it on right there, you know, in the room, and I watch it. And there is that moment in, in Apocalypse Now where he blows up. And he, throw, he tells Martin Sheen, you're not dead till I say you're dead. You know, I mean, he totally, and I watched the artist at work. And I was being tipped off. This is his method. I was still afraid, but I at least understood the purpose of his action. And I'll be quick. Anyway, I go to the hotel. I've got a huge room. He calls me and said, do you like your room? Yeah. Do you want a bigger room? No, I had it. The room is fine. You sure? No, no, it's fine. He said, well, I'll come down and see you in a few, in, a, in about 30 minutes. We'll talk. I hang up the phone, and there's a click on my door. He's got the key to my room. He opens the door, and he stands in the doorway, but he doesn't enter. He just stands in the doorway, you know, and he looks, he leans in and says, I can get you a bigger room. And I no, 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 Francis, no, I'm fine. He will not enter the room because... In order for Dracula to be allowed to come into the room, he has to be invited. And he's playing this game with me. And so I'm, we're about 20 feet apart. I'm sitting at the bar with my big giant computer, and he's a, and we start talking. And he finally says, um, what if Dracula turns into a big bat? And I'm going, this has been a running argument we've had, not with each other, but the whole idea of, of Dracula turning into a bat suddenly went camp. Everything in the film up until that point had been right out of the book. But to see him turn into a bat and fly out the window, we've lost the audience. It's then we're back in Campville. And I said, how big? Like a 747? He said, no, a big bat. You know, and he said, and, he, and I said, well, you, what does it look like? And he said, well, what does a vampire see when he looks in the mirror? It was a good question. And I said, we don't see anything, but the vampire sees the tormented soul. That they, that's why they don't like them because they see the thing they've turned into. He said, "That's what we're. That's that's the bat we're going to do." I said, "Great idea." So I'm glad you approve. And he took he took this big mold that that Greg Canham had done of the bat of the Gary bat that we see in the love scene. And he had figured all, he already said, it's good thing I've already got this figured out. You know, he'd already done it. I got the costume, I got the mold. So now when you see the scene in the film where she's drinking the blood and they come in and he turns out to be this thing, he delivers the same line, says not one line has been changed. Not one line was changed in the scene except for one that he wrote. And when I get to the set that day to watch him shoot, he's into the outfit and he goes, Jim, I got a surprise for you. I got. A, I came up with a line. I want. I want to try it out and see what they think in the take. And I'm going, great, Gary. You look good. You know. And there it is when he stands up in the bed and he says, "Look what your God has done to me." I didn't write that line, and I'm going, "Whoa!" The actor, in the costume, in the moment, in front of the cameras, with all the actors there, the director, everybody else, came up with the, the line that is the line that is the essence of the character. Take two. You want to see me do it again? What do you think? What do you and I and and that I mean that's the kind of experience I had on this movie. Yeah, uh, from one from one genius to another. I mean, just genius and bold and courageous. Yeah.